From the studios of Staten Island Community Television, you're watching In the Bleachers, the TV show for the world's most passionate sports fans. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Hickson. And hi, everybody. I'm Roger Federer, also known as Eric Rosen. <laughs> We're very happy that you could join us this evening, and we apologize for the little technical difficulty from earlier. We actually have uh, an old friend of ours working the other side of the glass. It's... Uh, She's affectionately known as Dr. Charlie. It's uh, Charlie Ferrer, who now does the show Cancer Tamer. So we're going to be welcoming her formally to the In the Bleachers family because she's going to be directing our show for tonight, and she's getting a little assistance from Kenny, who's also on the other side of the glass. So welcome, Dr. Charlie. That's how you're going to be known as from here on out. You're going to be known as Dr. Charlie because, for the record, she is a licensed doctor. But... Uh, if you want to know in what, you could probably check around on her show Cancer Tamer because she's done some really, really interesting episodes about the, the fight against cancer and what can be done to better cancer research. So in the meantime, we're going to be talking a whole lot of stuff, and we're going to see if we can take some phone calls, too. It's 718 727 0143 and as always you can check old episodes of ours on our Facebook page as well as YouTube and Twitter and you can also contact us through Snapchat and Instagram. And I definitely want to hear from you fans tonight. I uh, got a question for you. What do you think about the Knicks number 8 over number 8 overall pr uh, pick Frank Nikilakina from France? So definitely give us a call about that and what the Rangers did recently with trading Derek Stepan and getting the number 7 pick from the Phoenix Coyote the Arizona Coyotes. Mm -hmm. So right now let's go into the NBA draft. Congratulations to the Golden State Warriors, the second championship in three years, recently beating the Cleveland Cavaliers, 129-120. Stephen Curry's 34-point performance, but of course it was Durant who knocked down some huge three points, including the 17-foot fadeaway, and won the MVP. And I love the way the mo his mother came onto the yeah. court to hug and celebrate him, winning his first championship. So for all you people who hate Durant for what he did leaving OKC to go to Oakland, you know, la uh, Golden State last July. Well, what just happened this past year is the reason why he left OKC, because he wanted to win a championship now, not, you know, in another five years. He wanted to win right now, and he made the smart business decision. So I don't hate him like some other people did, you know, uh, or vo – He made his choice, and we're going to have to deal with it. But the bottom line is, he finally won that first championship. It's not going to define who he is as a player because he's always been a tremendous player. But ever since he joined Golden State last summer, he has really changed himself as a player. He's developed more of a mean streak. A better three-point shooting he's game. He's developed a much better three-point shooting game. Not that he didn't have it before, but he's... I'm not sure if it's coincidence or not, but mechanically, he's become a much better shooter, not just from three-point range, but all around. And he's become, uh, it seems like he's been really feeding off his teammates more with Golden State than he did with Oklahoma City. And this is not a knock on the guys that he had with Oklahoma City. But when you think about it, look at what happened with Thunder the last five years. Trading James Harden doing the coaching change, also uh, having to deal with a whole bunch of other changes. And the training, injuries. Yeah, the injuries to too. Reggie Jackson was also traded as well and, and several others. And did you hear about what Ines Cantor had to say about Durant in a recent interview? Basically, he called out Durant for, uh, for making the change going to Oakland last summer but when you think about it should we really be surprised at what has happened in this last year and think about it the to pressure is off his shoulders because when he was OKC a lot of the pressure was on his shoulders and Westbrook's he had no bench whatsoever to support him in Golden State there's a bench you have star three-point shooting you have good coaching all together you have supreme an, coaching yeah, whether it's Steve Kerr or you have Mike Brown 
coaching through Kerr. Either way, you have a good support system. And so because of all that pressure being lifted off his shoulders, he was able to play the type of game that he wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And that's what really helped him in his quest to get this championship. I know there are going to be some other people who think it's cowardly, it was terrible, that he has no uh Funny that you mentioned cowardly because whatsoever. that's what Stephen A. Smith uh, – called his move to Oakland last summer. He, he literally called him a coward. And who was the one that came to Kevin Durant's defense? His mother. Sweet woman, by the way. Very classy woman, too. Salt of the earth kind of person that I think we all wish we could have for a mother, too. Mm -hmm. Very nurturing, supportive of him in every decision. And, and didn't try to, never made boastful, arrogant statements. Was mm -hmm. always there for for his son Kev for her son Kevin, and it was just great to see the two of them embrace and hug each other on the floor in Golden State when the chant when the game was all over. Yep, and it was just to see him win the MVP two of the NBA Finals just was even sweeter right mm -hmm. there, and it vindicated his decision for leaving OKC. But now there's going to be the aftermath. The Warriors won their second title in the last three years, but. There's the issue of this coming Saturday. This coming Saturday is July 1st. July 1st is the start of the free agent season. And that means one thing. Who's going to go where? And the Warriors have quite a few free agents on their roster. Curry, Clay Thompson, and several others. I told you that there was a Clay Thompson to the Miami Heat rumor about a couple of months ago. At this rate, every, every player is available for contract talks or some kind of negotiations. But what do the Warriors do to try and get that third title in the last four years next season? Well, they try, you know what, they try to get to move some contracts. Uh, the, they're going to have to do their best to try to keep these guys together. And I know it's tough, especially in this day and age. Uh, hopefully the NBA does increase the cap space to allow this to happen. Um, I don't know how they're going to handle it. They're going to have to do a, a, a very delicate juggling act with these type of contracts. Mm -hmm. We know Durant has another year left on his deal. He, he actually is going to declare out of his contract, but he made it loud and clear. He's re-signing with the Warriors. And I think Curry and Thompson are going to do. With the situation they have, why the hell would they want to leave? It's a it's a good situation for them. Yeah. Instead of going to another team where they have to be the star and have the pressure on their shoulders, mm -hmm. they can have a bunch of people together again for another year in the run for another championship. I will say this, though. I think they could use a little bit more toughness in the middle because uh, Zaja Pachulia re really wasn't doing it for me or for the Warriors, for that matter. And also, they had a real bully when they won their first championship in Andrew Bogut, the first, uh, the first go around. And he wound up getting traded after last year, and now Bogut is going to be available as a free agent, I think, this summer. Should the Warriors try and make uh, a deal for a little muscle in the middle, or should they look at other areas of weakness? I think definitely some toughness in the middle, but there are three situations I'm going to be looking for this Saturday. One, Paul George. Is he going to be in Indiana or is he going to L.A., as we've all been hearing recently? Because the fact that he just uh, drafted uh, Lonzo Ball, not LeVar, even though he's opened his mouth left and right, they drafted Lonzo Ball. You got Julius Randle there. You got Ingram. You got Lopez. And then if you get a guy like Paul George right mm -hmm. there, with the money that they've saved and all that, because they have enough money to get to maybe do a, a sign and trade deal with Paul George. Mm -hmm. And believe me, that front, that starting five is going to contend in one of the toughest divisions because you've got to contend with the McCollum, uh, you know, in, in Portland, mm -hmm. along with uh, Damian Lillard. Yeah. Then you got, you know, the team like Golden State, the defending champions, too. So it's really a tough. And the Clippers, if, you know, DeAndre Jordan stays. Because that's the other thing, another situation to look at. The Clippers with DeAndre Jordan and CP3. And then the next thing I'm going to be looking for, is Gordon Hayward going to Boston? Yeah. That would be huge for them if they acquired his services. And then, finally, what's going to happen with the Cavs so they can get over that to get their second championship in four years? Well, it's funny you mentioned that because you mentioned Paul George 
And there already is a Paul George trade rumor where he's going to the Cavaliers and that Kevin Love would be going to the Nuggets as part of a three-way trade. And there are also really hot and heavy rumors of LeBron James leaving Cleveland again, this time to go to Los Angeles to play for either the Clippers or the Lakers. And Jerry West just resigned from his consultant position with the Warriors, and he has officially joined the Clippers. LeBron James has a movie production company. He also happens to have a house in Los Angeles. You put two and two together, you got four. What yeah. do you, well, in addition to that, you put two and two together. Would you happen, would you happen to think LeBron is going to be doing this to the people in Cleveland again? Or did he learn his lesson from the first time and decide to stick, stick. around for at least another four or five years? The, the, the summer is still young. And LeBron has one more year to go on his deal. So that story in itself is going to be saved for next year. But we do know one thing. There is one star who has himself a new home, and it's Jimmy Butler. He got himself traded by Chicago to Minnesota for Chris Dunn and Zach Levine. A lot of people are saying the Timberwolves got the better end of the deal because, one, they got an all-star caliber player in Butler, and, two, they got themselves a really promising prospect, Lowry Markkinen from Arizona, who's originally from Finland. Actually, the, that, that pick Lowry Markkinen, the Timberwolves made, that goes to the Chicago Bulls. Yep, that, that pick is going to go to the Bulls, and the Timberwolves uh, wound up getting uh, another prospect – who unfortunately his name escapes me right now, but everybody is saying that the, that the Timberwolves got the better end of the deal. Just think about it. Andrew Wiggins, Carl Anthony Towns, Jimmy Butler. Who now is Actually, reunited with Tom Thibodeau? They get Justin Patton, the uh, freshman from Creighton. Yep, and the Timberwolves get the number one pick, Justin Patton. Eventually, Minnesota is going to be a playoff team. They've gone 13 years without a single playoff game in, in the Twin Cities. Eventually, this mix of young players is going to pan out for them. Speaking of which, yeah, the draft did take place this Thursday mm -hmm. at the Barclay Center for yet another year in a row. Markel Fultz, as expected, the number one overall pick who went to the Philadelphia 76ers. We have yet to see Ben Simmons play a single minute. Joel Embiid as well has not played. We have seen a lot of these top draft picks from the Sixers over the last few years. Where, what have they done? Very little for this team, if at best. Sometimes they've done, they haven't been able to do much because they've gotten hurt. I mean, look at all of the kids that they have that wound up missing valuable time last year. Ben Simmons missed his whole rookie season. Joel Embiid, who was playing good basketball, missed 51 games. There was also the matter of Jalil Okafor. He's also had problems with his health. I know, and now, but Markel Fultz, he was the best overall prospect coming out of Washington. Uh, this guy has good defensive skills right there. Can play, uh, can shoot the three all right. Uh, I think he's, he's in fact, the, when he got selected, before he even got selected, when people already he said that he was consensus number one pick, they sold out three quarters, I think, or most of the tickets for next year for the Sixers. They're really excited in the city of brotherly love for Markel Fultz to play Let's hope that it's not all hype and that he's for real this time. Let's hope that he can keep his good health. Because after seeing Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid miss valuable time last year, who knows if the injury bug is going to hit Markel Fultz next season. They can only hope that, one, he keeps his good health in order, and two, those other two young men can recover from their foot injuries, both Embiid and Simmons had bad foot injuries. Joel Embiid missed his rookie season, 2015-16, because he broke his foot. Oh, yeah. And the number two pick was the LA Lakers. You know, as we mentioned earlier, not LeVar, 
but Lonzo got mm-hmm. drafted. Because the reason I keep saying that is because LeVar has been really the bane of my existence. Well, I wouldn't say go that far, but honestly, he's a pain in my butt to listen to. And I'm not probably the only one alone in that regard. This is a guy who's been the most arrogant person who's made boastful claims. He's literally writing checks. His son Lonzo may not be able to cash, you know, for the Lakers. He proclaimed at the draft that his son is going to take the Lakers to the playoffs in his first year. And he's going to have a hat that says, I told you so. He's oh, ready. my goodness. Do you know that LeVar Ball's first sport wasn't even basketball? Well, it was football. And get this. I could see that. He, ha- he I saw LeVar. LeVar was- actually played a little college ball back in the day. And he bounced around in the NFL for about three or four years. He even spent a training camp with the Jets not too long ago. Mm. And there were some there were some guys who actually thought that he wasn't really that bad of a guy. It's just a little a, just a little mm. full of himself. He's not a totally bad guy. The problem is he just loves I think he just loves to hear himself talk more than anything else. Of course, he he loves the sound of his own voice. But the problem with that, he, he really made him. He really made an ass of himself when he uh, did that interview with Colin Cowherd to talk about the the, the four hundred dollar sneaker, four hundred dollars for a new sneaker, which a couple of these shoe companies turned down. I know because he was charging exorbitant amounts of money. No, he is. Not just living vicari- trying to live vicariously through his son. He's tr- I think he's trying to exploit his son's accom- achievements or accomplishments. And that is so wrong. I love – there are parents you know, that, you know, that do that that I have no respect for. But there are parents like Kevin Durant's mother, you mm-hmm. know, those that are in the background. But yet, you know, at the same time, don't make such <laughs> boastful claims and are just there to be a parent. Not to say, oh, my – kid is better than this kid or that mm-hmm. you know the type of parent like Kevin Durant's mother those are the type of parents I have respect for not Lonzo Ball and I like Lonzo I really do and I feel for the guy and all that I know he probably loves his dad with all his heart like we all love our parents and all that but believe me I think his father is doing more of a disservice to him than helping him but yeah I'm hoping for Lonzo that he has a great year in LA I really truly do hope to see this guy you know, go to the to the top, to the mountaintop with the Lakers. Cause Laker fans can only hope that, that they can approach at least some kind of respectability next season. They've already gotten themselves off to a quick start because they made the Brook Lopez trade with the Nets, and the Nets wound up getting a bad contract, Timofey Mozgov, but Former the Nick. X factor in this whole thing is D'Angelo Russell, a point guard who I still think has a chance to be a really good player in this league. Quite frankly, I like the deal because, number one, the Nets do not have to put up with the headache of do they re-sign him or not. And two, D'Angelo Russell could probably be the best point guard that the Nets have had since Jason Kidd was traded away all those years ago. Oh, without a doubt. I think he needed a change of uh, scenery, too, considering, remember years ago, he had a situation with an ex-teammate of his with the whole uh, Ziggy Azalea situation. He recorded a private session between him and his teammate where he said, and I quote, that I did some things behind my girlfriend's back. It was reported on YouTube and through TMZ. <laughs> the team, the Lakers got wind of it, including that teammate who was ousted, whose name is eluding me. And It's he, Nick Young. Nick Young. He didn't take that too kindly as well as the rest of the team. And I think ever since that situation, it's been pretty – it's been very tense between him and the team. Oh, he, they alienated him. They, want nothing, they wanted nothing to do with him except on the court. Yep. So that's why I think he, for his, for the sake of his own peace of mind, he needs to go somewhere new. And I think it's going to work out well for the Nets and for the fans. And I'm excited to see D'Angelo Russell in the New York area. As for the Boston Celtics, Jason Tatum, another freshman from Duke Blue Devils. Josh Jackson, the freshman from Kansas, went to the Phoenix Suns. Mm-hmm. De'Aaron Fox, who I think is one of the best peer three-point shooters, went to the Sacramento Kings. Jonathan Isaac, probably the best big man in the draft, going to the Orlando Magic. And probably the most athletic, too. I mean, he is a shot-blocking machine, this kid. 
uh, Lori Marconin, who has some deficits in certain areas, you know, definitely I think could help the Bulls. Even though the Twin Timberwolves picked it, the rights of that pick go to the Chicago Bulls. And then there was number eight. The Knicks. The Knicks, just as had been rumored since January, wound up drafting Frank Nilakina, the French point guard, who from Dijon. Yep. Is six foot five, has a seven has has arms from here to Jersey. That's how and that's how much his wingspan is. He's got a seven foot wingspan. Really good defensive point guard. Great work ethic, too. The only problems with him is one, his handle is not great. And two, he really needs to work on his shooting. But the kid has works so hard and so diligently that I think Nick fans and better show some patience with this kid because keep in mind he's going to turn 19 in August and that's another thing are you sure it's wise for a franchise to entrust their starting point guard position on an 18 year old point guard who has played all of 60 professional games all of which were in Europe. By the way, let's look at Chris Stapps. When he came to the league, all right, they booed the crap at him. Everybody thought this guy was going to be an instant bust, but look what he's done. He's one of the best seven-foot rim protectors the Knicks have had in decades, honestly. And yet uh, the Zen master was thinking about trading him. You know, I as much as I like Phil Jackson for what he did with the Bulls and Lakers, I really think he's been a crappy general or president of operations for the Knicks. And he has this uh, moronic, and I wouldn't say moronic, and I take that back. An obsession not, is what he has with the, tri- with the triangle offense. You know, and it doesn't exist, Phil. Read my lips. The triangle is dead. No, no, one's run, no other NBA team is running the triangle offense right now. I don't even think I see a CYO team running a triangle offense right now. The only reason why he wanted to trade the kid away is because he blew off the exit interview, which is not necessarily endearing to a front office, but at the same time, can you really blame the kid? I mean, look at what he's been subjected to for the last two years now. Oh, how about last year? You know, with uh, some with Derek Rose coming on the team and Joe Kim Noah and, and their brilliant performances. And then the whole thing with Charles Oakley, an owner who is a egomaniacal, uh, self-involved, uh, despicable human being. And then... Speaking of Joachim Noah, how did that signing work out? Not well. It, it, it Barely was... played 30 games because he was hurt. And another a thing... A train wreck. How did the Brandon Jennings signing work out? Oh. He wanted himself released, and he wound up going to Washington. How'd the Courtney Lee deal work? Averaged barely seven or eight points a game. The, all on a four-year contract. The New York Knicks, the best soap opera money can't buy. You, you, know, you know, it's, a, it's so, funny that you mention that because many years ago, the writer, the, the, the baseball writer, Bob Klappich, wrote this rather infamous book about the 1992 Mets. It was called The Worst Team Money Could Buy because the Mets wound up signing Bobby Bonilla, Eddie Murray. Are we still paying for Bobby Bonilla, by the way? Yes, for another 20 years. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Which is crazy. The thing. And they made the trade for Brett Saberhagen. Well, after the summer that the Knicks had last year, signing Joachim Noah, making the trade for Derrick Rose, signing Courtney Lee and Brandon Jennings, you could argue that last year's Knicks team may have been the second worst team that money could buy after the Eddie Curry, Jerome James, and Jamal Crawford Knicks. And by the way, how did those teams work out? I don't know. You know what? After Jamal left, he actually had a great a resurging career with the Clippers. Yeah. It's it's amazing. He's been sixth man of the year with the Clippers. Marcus Camby had a better career after he left the Knicks, too. Led the NBA in, in shot blocking for a year or two with the, the, the Nuggets. It's funny that you mention um, Christoph Porzingis. Do you remember draft night 
the video of that kid who was literally in tears and giving thumbs down? He gave a thumbs up this well, past Thursday, and he had the... He had the goal to wear a Chris Stapp's jersey after what he did last year. Well, it's funny you mention that because just yesterday, ESPN did this really terrific E60 story. I'm sorry I said that goal. It's not nice to about say that, Chris Stapp's Porzingis. Just yesterday at 9 a.m., ESPN did an E60 story about Chris Stapp's Porzingis. Chris Stapp's Porzingis comes from a really good athletic athletic family. Both of his brothers played ball. His father played ball. His mother was a, also was a ball player. And unfortunately, there was a, a family tragedy in which a fourth brother uh, tragically died at age 10. And to this day, his mother will not talk about it because it really tears her to pieces. I don't blame her. Anything like that, I wouldn't blame any person for not wanting to discuss something like that. It's just, you know, it's opening up more emotional wounds than you want to at this point in your life. So, And, I mean, as, and they grew up in a real working-class neighborhood in Latvia. And all these guys ever did was bust their tails to try and make themselves as athletes. Once Porzingis jumped upon the scene two summers ago, Nick fans could not have fallen any more in love with him. I love the guy, but and obviously our general, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak, doesn't like him because his pride was hurt. his wounded pride, you mm -hmm. know, for the, missing that exit interview. And he and and he comes off saying, "Well, I love the guy, but we got to do what's best for the team." That's not what's Be what's best for the team is not trading away the kid who's basically become your best player. Not just your best. How many 21-year-olds at 7 foot can, be, can protect the rim like him? How many are there out there? Not many. Very few. So right there, that would be incredibly stupid of, of uh, you know. Well, the trade talk has died down for now, but again, a Phil it's Jackson only that, June. Bro. So let's see exactly what happens. But to, to bring up that point, remember that kid that was in tears and gave a thumbs down when the Knicks made that pick? Well, Porzingis invited the kid to one of his camps, challenged him to a game of one-on-one, -on -one, and outclassed the kid. He was blocking every shot left and right. And what happens? The kid winds up having at least 50 Kristaps Porzingis jerseys in his, in his bedroom closet. Oh, and did uh, please, did Chris Hobbs do a thumbs down after the game? I don't think so. I know. I just would have liked that, but at the same time, that's not Chris Epps. He's a classier person. Chris Hobbs Porzingis, you can tell he's a really good kid because he comes from really humble beginnings and really humble bloodlines, too, and really great bloodlines. We'll say this, though. After last year, they didn't uh, just settle on Porzingis. They really expanded their global influence. They got Willie Hernan Gomez, a kid from Spain. There was also Mindaugas Kuzminskis, who if I'm not mistaken is from Lithuania. And now there was this past Thursday night when they chose a teenager from France, Frank Nilakina. Yep. Could it be that what they're doing could maybe open more doors for young ball players to make their way to the New York area, if not to other NBA teams, because they're really opening, or they're, they're probably um, opening more of a pipeline for all of these international players. Without a doubt. But let's go to the rest of the picks. The Mavericks, of course, a team that also is in desperate need of a playoff spot this coming year, especially for their owner, Mark Cuban. They got Dennis Smith Jr. at North Carolina State. Mm -hmm. He was the SEC Player of the Year last year. Dennis Smith Jr., yeah, he was actually uh, you know, the, the Atlantic freshman. Coast Conference Rookie of the Year. And the he was Coast someone who uh, the, the Knicks were, were rumored to probably look at. The only thing with Smith is he – came off a torn ACL that he suffered his senior year of high school. So there's a little bit of a red flag with this kid. The, how about the Kings? The pick that they made with the number 10 goes to the Trailblazers, and the Trailblazers get Zach Collins from Gonzaga. So for him, it's a hop, skip, and a jump for him. He doesn't have mm -hmm. to go too far. And this is a guy who barely was a starter at 
up until last year with some of the injuries on the Gonzaga team, but mm-hmm. he's really shined as a player. Some of you can really is a good shot blocker for sure. Malik Monk, this was the guy I thought the Knicks were actually going to get, who was the twin, who was in that twin three point shooting tandem yeah. with De'Aaron Fox. And some say Malik was the better three pointer than De'Aaron. I don't know. It's you know, it's really. A- I saw Malik Monk play for Kentucky. That kid is a beast. He is ferocious defensively. He has a. He's got great. Great handles for a guy of of, uh, of his age. And he also, not necessarily a terrific shooter, but his shot is really, really improving. For sure. The Pistons got Luke Kennard at Duke, you know, mm-hmm. a sophomore shooting guard for the Pistons. Nuggets pit went to the Jazz. They got Donovan Mitchell from Louisville. The Miami Heat at number 14 selected Bam Adebayo, the freshman out of Kentucky. So that's three freshmen right there mm-hmm. from uh, the Wildcats. And then... Uh, number 15, the portrait, the Trailblazers pick goes to the Kings. That was Justin Jackson from North Carolina, the Tar Heels. You know, really was one of the big players in helping uh, the Tar Heels get the championship. Yeah. Then number 16, the Bulls uh, pick uh, goes to the Timberwolves, Justin Patton from uh, Creighton. The Bucks at number 17 get DJ Wilson from Michigan. Mm-hmm. At 18, the Pacers got TJ Leaf, the other freshman from uh, UCLA. That's right. The Hawks got John Collins, the sophomore from Wake Forest. Some are saying that TJ Leaf could be the best pure shooter in this entire draft. Definitely. You know, we've seen people who've gone very deep in the draft who've ended up becoming big stars. Look at uh, the Boston Celtics player. Yeah. And then the Portland Trailblazers, whose pick goes to the Kings, Harry Giles from Duke. Harry Giles from Duke University, who's a very adept guard. And Oklahoma City got Terrence Ferguson, who left to go play internationally in Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Terrence Ferguson's really, really interesting, though. He was born in Oklahoma City, raised in Dallas, skipped college altogether to play in Australia. Didn't play that much, but Ferguson's... Got a lot of pedigree. Something tells me that he's going to be able to help OKC down the road. The next, of course, got Jared Allen, the freshman from uh, Texas. That's a good pick. He's very, very limited offensively, but he brings them height. He brings toughness. He brings real physical strength, and he's a really, really good defensive center. They really need to take their time with this kid. If anything, I think he's more of a project than someone who can make an impact for them immediately, but that's going to come with time. He's only an, he's only 19. Speaking of projects, I love what the Raptors is. O.J. Anunoby from Indiana. Mm-hmm. This is a guy who I think, not next year or two, but three years down the line, he's going to be a big star for this Raptors team. Considering the other thing to look for in free agency, Kyle Lowry. Mm-hmm. Where does he sign? Because if he's not with the Toronto Raptors next year, this is a guy that they will develop into their big all-star to surround with. The Jazz, whose pick goes to the Nuggets, 24, Tyler Lydon out of Sy- Syracuse. Mm-hmm. The Magic get Anzegis Pashednik from Latvia, another Latvian citizen. Could it be that maybe Kristaps Porzingis has uh, opened unwittingly opened up some doors for more the Latvian ball players? Because Definitely. when you think about it, Porzingis is probably the the first really, really good ball player to come from that area. Keep in mind, Latvia used to be with the former Soviet Union, and ever since they uh, broke ties with the uh, old communist regime 25 years ago, the country has not really had an athletic identity. But now... With Porzingis being here, let's see if he becomes the latest in a long line of Latvian ballplayers. And it's not just basketball players either. Overall athletes. Without a doubt. The Trailblazers, one of my favorite stories of the year, of course, Caleb Swanigan. This was a guy who was in and out of foster care homes, finally got adopted by a loving uh, father who helped him with a lot of the weight issues he was dealing with in his life. There was a time when he was actually tipping the scales at 300 pounds, and he was only 13 then. But then because he really helped him get his life together, really put him on a strict diet, made sure that he studied, went to school, and you know really uh, honed his craft of playing basketball, got himself... you know, an, a scholarship from Purdue to play there, and he has done wonders. He took them to the Sweet 16 mm-hmm. with his ability to shoot. He still has some other things that he's got to work on, but I think Portland has somebody 
that can really do them wonders next year, I would say, or yeah. two, three years down the line. For sure. The Nets, of course, their pick goes to the Lakers. Kyle Kuzma from the Utah Utes. Mm-hmm. The Lakers, whose pick goes to the Jazz, they get uh, Tony Bradley from North Carolina. Yep. And the Spurs at 29, Derek White, the first senior. This is the first time no senior has been selected in the first, you know, this this late into the first round. Yep. The Spurs get Derek White out of Colorado. Mm-hmm. And the Utah Jazz, whose pick goes to the Lakers, Josh Hart from Villanova. It's really interesting that you mentioned Derek White's name. Derek White is a guy who never received any interest from Division I programs. The only reason why he got to Colorado was because he transferred from a Division II program, University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, where he was a 27-point-per-game scorer. And then he makes his way to the D1 program, has a great loan season with the Buffaloes, and he winds up in the NBA. Just a great, great story for this kid. And how about Josh Hart? Wins a national championship his junior year. Leads the Wildcats to a, a Big East title his senior year. Graduates on time at, at, at Nova. And now he's made his way to the big time. Really wish this kid well. I mean, especially with the Lakers now with him. He's going to be a bench player. He's not going to be a starter next year, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. But he'll be somebody that can come off the bench, especially in those three-point situations. I could see that happening with the Lakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's all the first-round picks of the NBA draft. This is... You know, really exciting uh, yeah. you know, for all these players. And but as it turns out, the Nets uh, wound up making, I think, one more pick in the second round. They wound up getting this kid from the University of Houston. And the Knicks made a couple of, made two picks in the second round. Not really sure if they're going to be making any type of impact, but let's see what they do down the road. And speaking of drafts, this past uh, weekend we had the NHL draft and the number one overall pick, Nico Hischler, of the Halifax Mooseheads, that's the Quebec uh, Minor Junior Hockey League, mm-hmm. uh, was selected and from Switzerland to the Devils. He's the first ever Swiss-born player to be drafted first overall into the NHL. A good two-way player. This mm-hmm. guy has a lot of power forward strength. One of the best pure goal scorers in this draft. Then Nolan Patrick, who was the number two overall prospect, got selected by the Flyers from the I. H I F K of the league no, of of sorry the Brandon Wheat Kings of the Western Hockey League. Mm-hmm. Then number three, the Dallas Stars got the Finnish player Miro Heiskanen of the Hifka Liga, which is uh, the um, Finnish Hockey League. The Avalanche got Kale Makar of Brooks Bandits. That's the uh, uh, AJHL League in Canada. The Vancouver Canucks got Elias Peterson of Sweden from Tirma IK Hockey. Alvis Asvinkin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very hard to pronounce half these things. Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Rangers, the, the Vegas Golden Knights with the sixth pick, Cody Class, the Portland Winterhawks. Yep, the, the Western very Hawks. first draft pick that the Golden Knights wound up making. Now, if only they could just do something about that logo. Have, have you seen their logo? They've got the Magneto from the X-Men helmet. For a logo. Let's just call them the, the Las Vegas Gambler. Seriously. We'll put a slot machine there. We'll put Sony who's basically putting money into the machine. Because, honestly, this is a giant gamble, this team. Yeah. To, not and to the league upon. itself is taking a gamble having an NHL franchise in Las Vegas. A, a place where uh, whatever happens there stays there. Well, and eight. the fans are going to be hoping that whatever happens with their franchise stays with Vegas. But uh, as far as the as the Rangers are concerned, they made a huge trade where they wound up sending away Derek Stepan. Good was, move or bad move? To me, it, well, it's a gutsy move. Let's put it that way. It's a very, very gutsy move. And when you think about it, Derek Stepan... His play kind of regressed a little bit this past season, so I don't think it was a terrible move, but let's see what happens here. But it's who they wound up uh, getting in return. 
they wound up getting um, a Swedish setter, Leas Anderson. Of the HV71, which is the Swedish Hockey League there. It's, it's an interesting pick for sure. He does have a lot of attributes. He can score. There's some uh, His two-way ability definitely needs working on. But I will say this. Getting re- not only step, I think the one thing that really burned me was Anti Ranta being a part of this trade too. Yeah, your, your backup goaltender who was really sensational when uh, Henrik Lundqvist was not, yeah, you know, was not there on the ice. So which that, means could it be that maybe the Rangers look for a veteran presence to try and back up Lundqvist for next season, or do they? Dip into the farm one more time. I would say they need to go for some veteran backup leadership. That's for sure. Uh, as for the, the Sabres, they got Casey Mitstadt of the Green Bay Gamblers mm-hmm. in the United States Hockey League. Speaking of gamblers. He's, uh, I think he's committed to college, actually, at the University of uh, Minnesota. The Red Wings, Michael Rasmussen, most of the USHL players – typically they commit to college before they go to the NHL. And that's mm-hmm. what I like about the NHL, that you can actually go to college, then you can play for your NHL team that drafted you. Not many leagues allow you to do that. Yeah. In baseball, uh, if a kid gets drafted out of high school and then he decides to go to college for three years, he's going to be eligible for the draft again. And it's a, it's minuscule that they, they, that they get drafted by the same team. But let's... It would be really interesting if Major League Baseball decided to adopt that kind of rule that the NHL has. I think it would be great, but uh, I won't hold my breath. Mm-hmm. Uh, as the Red Wings, Michael Rasmussen is the Trice of the Americans. The Panthers got Owen Tippett, the right winger of the Missaga Steelheads. This guy right here, if you watch his play on the ice, mm-hmm. he's going to transform this team for sure. He's going to give them a real starter to look at for next year. Look for him to probably win the Rookie of the Year award. Mm-hmm. The Los Angeles Kings, uh, Gabriel Velarde of the Windsor Spitfires. At number 12, the Hurricanes got Martin Neckis, the Cometa Berno in the Extra Liga Czech League. The Vegas Golden Knights got their second pick in the first round, Nick Suzuki of the Owen Sound Attack. The Lightning got Callan Foote of the Kelowna Rockets. The Vegas Golden Knights, yet again. Mm-hmm. At number 15, Eric Brandstrom of the Swedish Hockey League. Calgary Flames with Yasso. And then let's go down to the Rangers at 21. They select again. Philip Saitil, another center from, uh, from the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. And the uh, that's pretty much yeah, it right there. You know, yep. um, not you know, much with the, uh, with the Islanders in this round. But uh, I'll be honest, uh, it's going to be a crazy year. Who will take the trophy away from Pittsburgh? <laughs> I hope it's Nashville. I hope Nashville wins this year if not my Rangers. Well, at this rate, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. It's only June, and July is right around the corner. But it's going to be really interesting to see how these guys move around with uh, with their free agent signings. It's interesting how the Devils made a kid from Switzerland their first overall draft pick. The reason why the Devils won their three cups was because they built themselves through the draft took a long time. It, it was 13 years after they made the move to the Garden State from, from Denver before they won their first championship. But they built with guys like Marty Ken Danico and Marty Brodeur, both of whom were, were number one draft picks and, and, and several others. And because of that, they won the championship in 95, I believe they in the early 2000s, mm-hmm. too. They were a championship contending club. And also Patrick Elias. Patrick Elias was the number of draft pick that went through the Devils system. He spent two decades in a Devils uniform. Until he uh, went to Minnesota to be with the Wild. Mm-hmm. And, which, and so far, that's been working out somewhat for him. Now, let's go into some baseball action. This past week, the New York Mets got swept by the Dodgers, including some big home runs. If you saw it this past Monday, Cody Bellinger... Just broke the record that Gary Sanchez had last year mm-hmm. for most home runs in less than 56 games. And how about the record that, they, that the Dodgers broke in that series? 15 home runs in a four-game series. That is just – that's EA Sports uh, 2K17 numbers that you play on a video game. And what was the most interesting this past week was – I think it was the Wednesday game in which – 
uh, Wilmer Flores was pissed off at Yasiel Puig after Yasiel hits his dinger to, I think it was left field, and Puig is just sitting there admiring it, and Flores was, didn't, wasn't going to have it. He told him, you better move along. And when you get these two guys, especially with the emotions boiling over, you know a fight was brewing, and there, were, there was a possible fight about to go down. Well, fortunately, these guys uh, kept their composure, but I can understand their frustrations, but quite frankly, they really need to move past this because trying to pick a fight with Yoenna Cespedes is not going to get anyone anywhere except beaten up. Well, Yoenna Cespedes is a big, strong guy. He looks like he could probably beat somebody's ass. Well, actually, Yoenna Cespedes was trying to talk to uh, was trying to talk to Puig along with uh, another. What did I say, Yoenna Cespedes? I meant Yasiel Puig. I know, and Cespedes and um, Reyes actually tried to talk to Puig about this, and he was like, yeah, well, whatever you guys have to say. Mm -hmm. But the Dodgers won that series, and because of that, they moved into first place in the NL West over the Rockies, who before this week, the Rockies had the lead, I think it was like a game and a half going to this past week. Then the Mets played what I consider the worst, the absolute worst team I've ever seen in Giants history since like 1976. They were the first team this year to have 50 losses since the bicentennial. That's how bad things have gone it's for the Giants. It's really disappointing what's happened with that team. I mean, they went from a wild card last year, unfortunately at the expense of, of the Mets, to dead last in the National League West this year. The, the injuries have not helped, specifically to Madison Bumgarner. But when you think about it, the pitching staff has just been god-awful this year. They have no bullpen. Aside from Bumgarner, the, the st starting rotation has been a complete, completely abysmal, and naturally because the, the team has been so dreadful, Johnny Cueto has already uh, decided to exercise his opt-out clause for the end of the season. Well, you know, there's going to be tr he's going to probably be shopped around at the July 31st deadline. And don't be shocked to hear Hunter Pence's name, too. There's yeah. probably going to be some names floating around for the Giants. Because they're at that point. They're already, what, 20 games back in the NL West. So you know there's going to be some trades coming down the pipeline from the Giants for sure. For the Mets, on the other hand, this was just an easy victory. Now they have a day off tonight. They're heading to Miami for a three-game set. And then they come back home this weekend to play the Phillies. These are two division teams they have to win this week against. At least the Mets were able to save some face by completing that three-game sweep of the Giants the way they did. But that was the California portion of their road trip. They end their road trip in Miami uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Now... The Mets have sunk all the way down to fourth place. I mentioned last week, maybe it's time for the Mets to start being sellers instead of buyers. Because right now, the Nationals are not giving up that Eastern Division lead. That team is too strong, unless you get to their bullpen. Should the Mets maybe start auctioning off some of their veteran players. Not Cespedes, that's for sure. I mm -hmm. would not do that. But Reyes could be a possibility. I'll it, tell you right now, Jose Reyes is untradeable. He has no market value right now. But you know what? If to, anything, to I would... To an I would that needs to, yeah. Nope. Been there, done, done that with the Blue Jays. I, I hate to say this, but Jose Reyes is officially washed up. He cannot hit anymore. He has looked lost at the plate. He cannot drive the ball anymore. Don't let those home runs that he's hit fool you. He is officially in the twilight of his career, which is really sad considering he's only Bruce. 34. Jay Bruce, yes, because he has been their best hitter this season. And it wouldn't be shocking to hear his name. And you Asdrubal know Cabrera, too, because he's already demanded to be traded now that he balked about being moved to second base. Or Michael Conforto for some prospects. You know, granted, it'd be stupid at the same time because he's the future of the franchise. I would not trade Michael Conforto. I would make him uh, the centerpiece of at least their outfield. Curtis Granderson, well, I, I would say it's 70-30 that he gets moved because there have been times when he's looked lost at the plate, too. I mean, he's, a, he's barely a 220 to 230 hitter. Well, you, t you trade him to an AL team that needs somebody, some depth and all that, too. I would say a team, 
uh, in the AL Central, like possibly Detroit again, his old team, Mm -hmm. Minnesota, possibly Cleveland. You get one of those three teams that can trade some prospects Mm -hmm. over. You know, something like that. I wouldn't say AL East team. I don't think one – maybe Boston. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nearby. And now that would be a thorn in his – and the Yankees side too as well. Mm-hmm. So there, there's some possibilities with Granderson where he could possibly go. As for the Yankees this past week, they had uh, the day off on Monday. Then they lost two out of three to the Angels and two out of three to the Rangers. This team is slumping right now. The Yankees have now lost eight of their last 11 games. That's one thing. The other thing is now they've got guys who have suddenly found themselves on the disabled list. C.C. Sabathia, now Aaron Hicks, who's going to be gone about four weeks. Is Mike Montgomery the guy that's been replacing C.C.? Jordan Montgomery. Oh, Jordan mean, Montgomery. Yeah. yeah. Jordan Montgomery hasn't been completely terrible. I mean, he's a rookie. I mean, it, it's, it's unfair to expect way too much out of the kid, but he's held his own. That's one thing. But yesterday, we saw the ugly side of Michael Pineda. He was dreadful. Giving up, what was it, four, three or four home runs yesterday. They were down seven to nothing, and they tried every which way to come back from a seven-run deficit, especially at the end when Gary Sanchez made a ridiculous base running blunder, getting himself thrown out, trying to get from first to third on a base hit. It, it, it was just foolish, foolish base running right there. That, that's what killed the rally there. On, whole, on Old Timers Day of all days, with all the greats that came to play yeah. a one-hour softball game, like Rich Goose Gossage was there. Goose Gossage was there. Gidry. And, and guys from way back in the day, Dr. Bobby Brown, who now has the distinction of being the oldest living Yankees World Series champion. He's in his early 90s. Then you have... Whitey Ford, he's going to turn 89 years old this fall. Willie Randolph, I believe, was. Willie Randolph was there, too. Lee Mazzilli. Lee Mazzilli, who spent uh, quite a few years as a coach with the Yankees, had a cup of coffee with them as a player. Reggie, of course, was there. Reggie Jackson. you got to have Miss Bernie uh, Williams. And, yep, the guys, from, the guys from the uh, 96 and 98 through 2000 championship teams were there as well. Surprise, Bernie, not Paul there. O'Neill. Tino Martinez was there as well. Andy, Andy Pettit, unfortunately, had a prior commitment. Hideki Matsui was not there either. He had a prior commitment. But it was good to see a lot of these guys of make their way back to the stadium. And, and David uh, Cohn, I think, was yep, also there, too. David as, Cohn was there as, as well. Had a perfect game, in fact, back in 1998 with the New mm-hmm. York Yankees. Don Larson, from the, ni- the, on- the guy who has the distinction of being the only person to throw a perfect game in the 1956 World Series. Yep. Just, and just to give you an idea about how much time has moved on, Dr. Bobby Brown... Bob Lawson, and Whitey Ford. And also, to a lesser extent, Hector Lopez, who was a Yankee for roughly eight years. He played on five consecutive pennant winners in the early 60s. Those are the four senior Yankee legends that are left on this earth. It's really unbelievable that they were all there. I wish I could have been there in a sense, too. But and to a lesser extent, Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson is 70 years old now. It was definitely a, uh, it's, it's great to have all these – that they were all – that's what I love about the Yankees. The only team that actually does this where they have – where they celebrate the past mm-hmm. and all the great players that came before today's Yankees. And you could see how much the opponents respect some of these guys for making their, their way – to the stadium for such a, a favorite promotion that the Yankees do. Because there were a lot of the guys in the Rangers dugout that were taking video on their iPhones of this whole spectacle. You can't blame them because you got Louisiana Lightning right there. Mm-hmm. One of the greatest pitchers in the 70s. Rich Goose Gossage, a Hall of Fame closer who was nasty with those 90-mile-per-hour mile fastballs. And pitched three to four innings at a time to get a save. Which is unheard of in today's. You're you're lucky if you get some of your closers to go maybe six outs and all that. Yeah, you know, lucky. 
you don't get that much today. You know the old Nolan Ryan philosophy, pitch to your arm falls off? Mm-hmm. Texas Ranger actually the only team that applies that because, you know, Nolan Ryan is in their front office. Now let's He's go- basically the boss, not just in the front office. He's the boss of the Rangers. Seven no-hitters. And the Mets, of course, trade him. Stupid move on their part. Mm-hmm. But anyway, in the fast-track news, Brooks Copa won his first U.S. Open championship a few weeks ago, tying Rory McIlroy's record. Andre Ward defeated uh, Sergei Kovalev in eighth-round knockout. In their most recent bout, Kyle Larson uh, defeated Ch- Chase Elliott for, at the Michigan Speedway two weeks ago. And at Money in the Bank, the latest pay-per-view that took place for WWE, the Hype Bros beat the Colognes, which, of course, come from a great wrestling family in the pre-show. That's such an, a shame right there. Uh, women's Money in the Bank ended shamefully, too. Carmella won the match, defeating Natalia, Charlotte, Tamina, and Becky Lynch because James Ellsworth went on the ladder and helped Carmella get the briefcase. Mm -hmm. How shameful to end it, but they're going to rectify it tomorrow night Mm -hmm. with a rematch of this match. Uh, SmackDown Tag Team titles, the New Day defeat the Usos via countout, but as you know, if you can't win the championship by countout, it has to be pinfall or submission. So mm-hmm. the Usos remain your champions. The women's title, Naomi defeated Lana via submission with the FTG. That's called Feel the Glow. Uh, mm-hmm. The championship title match, Jinder Mahal defeated Randy Orton via pinfall with the Kalash, which is sort of a modernized version of the rock bottom. Mm-hmm. Breeze Dangle defeated the Ascension via pinfall. Money in the Bank ladder match, Baron Corbin won. Wow. I'm so happy for this guy. He won the uh, Andre the Giant Memorial Bow Royal just a few years la- in in Dallas, and he defeated AJ Styles, Shinsuke Nakamura, Kevin Owens, Dolph Ziggler, and Sami Zayn mm-hmm. to retain one of the best items any WWE superstar could have. Yeah, it guarantees you a title shot in the next year at any moment you want, mm-hmm. and most it has what 85 percent rate of success. Mm-hmm. Which is saying something right there. Really saying something. Remember Seth Rollins? Yep. The way he cast the title WrestleMania when it was, I believe it was Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns mm-hmm. fighting each other. The biggest steal of the century. We've got just under three minutes left. We'd be remiss if we did not mention what's going on inside the fighting ring. It is official. It will be Floyd Mayweather against Conor McGregor. In a winner-take-all, actually winner-gloat-style uh, uh, match. It's going to happen. It's signed, sealed, delivered. It's going to be taking place later this year. August 26th. August 26th, to be exact. If I'm not mistaken, I think the, the, the match is going to take place in Vegas, right? Yes, at the T-Mobile Arena. It's going to be a 12-round match, 10-pound boxing gloves on both opponents. It will not be an MMA-style match, so really... This, for McGregor, he's sort of a fish out of work because he yeah. can't do half the things he would love to do to Floyd. If anything, some, of, some are calling this the sporting event of the year, but do you think the fans will be able to – we know they're going to sell out the T-Mobile arena, but do you think fans will be able to pay the 50 to $100 in pay-per-view fees – to see this match, or should they not even bother? Just go to Buffalo Wild Wings right there, where they always have the fights on. You don't have to pay for it. They're the ones footing the bill. All you got to do is pay for beer, wings, and, uh, <laughs> that's and a one good time. Thing. And that's really it. Or if you get a few friends together at your house, you know, and they all put $10 in right there mm-hmm. along with the food and everything, you know, just ways that you can save money without actually having to spend. Yeah, pay the full hundred dollars because I made that mistake with the Pacquiao Mayweather fight, money that I'll never see again. Well, it's funny that you mention uh, that, that that this is going to be only a boxing style match. Let's see if Conor McGregor can uh, keep his feet to himself in this one. Now, before we sign off, we want to give a special word of thanks to every one of you for watching us at home. And thanks once again to Dr. Charlie and to Kenny on the other side of the glass. Thank you, guys. Welcome to the family, Dr. Charlie. So for everyone here, for Eric, I'm Jamie. Hope to see you next week. Good night, everyone. Peace out, Staten Island, and watch out next week. Wimbledon gets started. Grass championships.